Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. This episode of the History Guy Podcast is brought to you by Magellan TV a new kind of streaming service that aims to bring you the best documentaries from around the world. On today's episode, we talk about the children of two of Russia's most notorious leaders. First is the story of Tsarevich Dmitri, youngest son of Ivan the Terrible. Killed in his youth, years later, men would appear claiming to be Dmitri and pressing their rights to the Russian throne. Then the history guy will talk about the daughter of the most infamous Russian leader in history, Joseph Stalin and her struggle to escape her father's shadow. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. There's a good chance that you're familiar with the story of the Grand Duchess Anastasia, youngest daughter of Tsar Nicholas II. While it was reported that she had been killed along with the rest of her family in 1918, at least 10 different women in history have come forward to claim that they were the Grand Duchess Anastasia. And while the, the story of Anastasia has been popularized in films and fiction enough that you've probably heard the story, what you might not know is that the Grand Duchess Anastasia was not the first child of a Tsar to have supposedly died as a child, only to have adults come forward years years later, claiming to be them. Because at the turn of the 17th century, in a time in Russia that was so full of strife that is referred to as the time of troubles, at least three different men rose to power, claiming to be the murdered Prince Dmitri, youngest son of Ivan the Terrible. It is history that deserves to be remembered. In 1591, Tsarevich Dmitri, youngest son of Ivan the Terrible, died in the city of Oglich. Dmitri and his mother had been sent to Oglich after Ivan's death in 1584. Maria Nagaya, Dmitri's mother, was either the fifth or seventh wife of Ivan the Terrible. Sources disagree. But as the Russian Orthodox Church only recognized the first three marriages, by any measure Dmitri did not have a strong claim to the throne. Maria suspected foul play, however, in the form of Boris Gutenov, advisor to Dmitri's half-brother, Tsar Fyodor, and the de facto ruler of Russia. She was not the only one. And as the church bell in Oglik rang out the news, the townspeople rose up to protest the suspected assassination. Gutenhoff sent a force to quell the discontent, and after executing some of the townspeople, he demonstrated his authority by punishing the church bell. Yes, the bell. He had it cut down, had its tongue symbolically removed by removing the clapper, had the bell publicly flogged, and then exiled the bell to Siberia. An official commission was sent to determine the cause of Dmitri's death, and they determined that the eight-year-old Tsarevich had fallen on his own knife during an epileptic seizure. He was buried and for a time forgotten. His mother was forced to take the veil in a nunnery. Dmitri's father, Ivan the Terrible, was born in 1530 and ruled Russia from 1533, first as the Grand Prince of Moscow and later as the first Tsar of all Rus. He was a member of the Rurikid dynasty, which had ruled in one form or another over parts of Russia since the 9th century. Ivan's reign heralded many changes that would affect the later history of Russia. He was the first Russian ruler to be crowned Tsar of all Rus, a deliberate and important change meant to emphasize his power as a sole ruler, and an explicitly religious one as well, with divine right to rule. He instituted a number of reforms that would affect the trajectory of the nation. He revised the law code, ordered the construction of St. Basil's Cathedral, and instituted a number of councils and a feudal Russian parliament. Ivan also established a standing army. He greatly expanded Russian territory and fought wars with mixed results against Sweden, the Ottomans, Poles, and Lithuanians. But Ivan left a complicated legacy. Although Ivan's epithet, the terrible, was not intended to give the modern connotations of evil or bad, it's actually more properly translated as the formidable, and he was generally well-liked, Ivan the Terrible was given to occasional bouts of rage and sometimes mental instability, something which only grew worse after the death of his beloved first wife, Anastasia Romanova. In 1570, he ordered an attack on the city of Novgorod, which he accused of being disloyal. The estimates of the death toll differ. The first Pskov Chronicle estimated the death toll at 60,000, while some historians number the deaths around two or 3,000, including the Archbishop, who was hunted to death. Almost as disturbing, in 1581, Ivan the Terrible struck his 27-year-old son, Ivan, the heir to the throne, with a scepter during an argument. The blow proved fatal, and Ivan V died on November 19, 1581. 
his death would lead to the unwinding of the Rurikid dynasty. When Ivan died of a stroke during a game of chess in 1584, he left his third son, Fyodor I, as Tsar. Fyodor, good-natured but simple-minded, was sidelined while Boris Gudunov, a former advisor of Ivan, ruled from the background. It was Boris who was in charge when Ivan's son Dmitri was killed in Oglitch, and Boris who punished the Oglitch bell. When Fyodor died childless in 1598, Gudunov was made Tsar. It was then that the troubles began. The time of troubles in Russia refers to the period after the death of Fyodor, the last Rurikid Tsar, until 1613, when the first Tsar of the Romanov dynasty was crowned. This period was marked by strife, war, and a famine caused when extremely cold summer temperatures wrecked Russian crops between 1601 and 1603. The famine resulted in the deaths of nearly a third of Russia's population, almost two million people. Gudunov was unable to provide stability. He attempted to feed the poor in Moscow, which led to refugees flocking to the capital. Meanwhile, armed bands terrorized the countryside, and hunger and disease ravaged the country. Into this crisis stepped a man who would begin one of the oddest series of events in Russian history. In 1603, a man named Dmitri appeared in the Poland-Lithuania Commonwealth, claiming to be Ivan the Terrible's son, the Dmitri who had supposedly been killed in 1591. He claimed to have escaped death when the assassins mistakenly killed another boy. Even his mother would eventually confirm the story. Known to history as False Dmitri I, Russia was rife with discontent and ready to accept a change in leadership. In 1604, False Dmitri I invaded with an army of Poles, Lithuanians, Russian exiles, German mercenaries, and Cossacks, and began a series of wars that were so defined by men claiming to be the Tsarevich Dmitri that the wars were called the Dmitriads. Tsar Gudunov's position was weak. He denied False Dmitri's claims, insisting instead that he was a runaway monk, although it is unclear what evidence he had. Gudunov's many enemies gathered to Dmitri, sensing opportunity. Fighting only two engagements and badly losing the second, False Dmitri I would have failed if not for the timely, or perhaps untimely, death of Tsar Gudunov of a stroke on April 13, 1605. Reluctant Russian forces defected to Dmitri's cause, and on the 1st of June, 1605, Gudunov's successor, his son Fyodor, was imprisoned and later murdered. False Dmitri I was crowned Tsar of Russia on the 21st of July, 1605. But False Dmitri I's reign was far from popular. Dmitri is accused of bringing foreign influence to the realm, an accusation made stronger by his keeping Polish soldiers in Moscow and at his court, and marrying the Polish princess, Maria Ninzek, who refused to convert from Catholicism to Russian Orthodoxy. On the 17th of May, 1606, less than a month after his marriage, the Kremlin was stormed by conspirators who had earlier supported false Dmitri I. Dmitri attempted to escape through a window, but broke his leg in the fall. False Dmitri I was shot by the conspirators, his body was displayed, and then eventually cremated and reportedly put into a can and fired from a cannon in the direction of Poland. A nobleman named Vasily Shuisky, a leader of the conspirators, was made czar, but he was in a precarious position and he was never generally recognized. But the tale of Dmitri was not over yet. In July of 1607, another man appeared, claiming to be Ivan's son Dmitri. Not only that, this man claimed to be false Dmitri I, having miraculously escaped Dmitri's second death, claiming that, apparently, the wrong guy's ashes had been shot out of the cannon. This false Dmitri was well-educated, speaking several languages, and possibly the son of a priest or a converted Jewish person. He was even recognized by false Dmitri I's Polish wife. False Dmitri II invaded Russia again, with some success eventually camping in Tishino, 12 miles from Moscow, and gathering an army of over 100,000 soldiers. He would come to be known as the Rebel of Tushino. Claiming that he would confiscate the land from the nobles, False Dmitri II became popular with the common folks, but False Dmitri II's luck could not last, as the convoluted politics of Russia's neighbors changed the nature of the game. In 1609, in an attempt to shore up his rule, Tsar Vasily signed an alliance with Charles IX, King of Sweden. But Charles's nephew, Sigismund III, the monarch of the Polish-Lithuania Commonwealth, was a rival, and the alliance motivated him to invade as part of his goal of reclaiming the Swedish throne that he had held until 1599. 
And what all of that really means is that false Dmitry II ceased to be a useful pawn in anybody's fight over the control of Russia. Between the approach of the Russo-Swedish army, the defection of most of his Polish troops to Sigismund III, a potential compromise to pay, place Vladislav, Sigismund III's son, on the throne as the Tsar, false Dmitry II was forced to flee. For a while he lived with and had a child with the Polish wife of false Dmitry I before he took an army of Cossacks and took control over and ruled most of southeastern Russia. Then he fell prey to internal politics. On December 11, 1610, Dmitri and several of his nobles took a sleigh to go drinking in the country. Peter Urasov, a Tatar prince and supporter, followed close behind with some of his cohorts, ostensibly as an escort. But Peter had been flogged by Dmitri and was out for revenge. As Stanislaw Zukieski, a celebrated Polish commander, would recall in his memoirs, and when the impostor had drunk very well, Urasov drew from his holster a pistol, which he had had ready, and galloping up to the slave, first shot him with the pistol, then cutting off his head and hand with his saber, took to the road. But the Dmitri story had still not ended. In 1612, yet another man appeared from a river in Ivangorod, claiming to be Ivan the Terrible Son, at this point killed three times. Identified as a former deacon, he convinced an army of Cossacks already raiding around Moscow to support him and they acknowledged him as Tsar on March 2nd, 1612. False Dmitri III also became known as the Thief of Pskov, as he made the people of the town of Pskov pledge allegiance to him with the threat of destruction. But perhaps Russia was finally getting tired of pretenders to the throne calling themselves Dmitri, because he lasted for only a few months before he was forced to flee Pskov, was betrayed, and then transported to Moscow, where he was killed in July. Anna Anderson, the best known of the women who claimed to be the Grand Duchess Anastasia, sued to be recognized in a German court from 1937 to 1970. It was the longest recorded court case in German history. She was not the Grand Duchess Anastasia. DNA evidence collected in 1991 and 2000 proved definitively that all three of Tsar Nicholas II's daughters died with the rest of the family. Likewise, while the identity of false Dmitri I is still unknown, historians don't believe that any of the false Dmitris were actually the sons of Ivan the Terrible. Rather, they were ambitious men who saw opportunity during the time of troubles and were exploited by Russia's neighbors, enemies, and a discontented populace. It would not be until 1613 that 16-year-old Michael Romanov, a descendant of the brother of Ivan's first wife, was unanimously elected Tsar of Russia by a national assembly that the country began to recover. Michael Romanov tied up loose ends by having the son of false Dmitri II hanged and his wife strangled. It was a symbolic end to the wars called the Dmitriads. Now is the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and a few behind the scenes things that you only get to hear about on the podcast. Gentlemen, start your engines. You're listening to the History Guy podcast, and we're coming to you from a hotel room in Indianapolis, Indiana. Lovely Indianapolis. Home of the Speedway. And we're, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Yep, yeah, we're out here getting some good uh, getting some good content. We got to we've worked on a couple of episodes with those guys. Yeah. And so this time we were able to finally come out and kind of take a look at what they've got. It was really, really cool. Oh, yeah. You know, the, the Motor Speedway Museum is surprising. And uh, it's, you know, the Indianapolis 500 is so important to the history of Indianapolis. Uh, and it's really such an interesting sport because there's so much pageantry. There's so many traditions involved. Uh, and we got to see some parts of the museum that people don't necessarily always get to see. And it's been it's been great. They've been very kind, and I think we're going to come out with some more great topics. If you care anything about cars, or I mean history too, because it's not just they don't have just the speedway stuff, but they've got Indianapolis car stuff, and uh, they've got some really really old cool cars, and yeah, also some good. very valuable ones. We're not but, really gearheads, uh, but still, I mean, the history here was just a whole lot of fun to see, and look forward to some great episodes coming here out of Indianapolis. And so we just listened to. An episode about uh, Zarevich Dimitri. This this is this is one of my favorite episodes, honestly. But I also have it on a pretty good authority that it is got a special place in the history guy's heart. It does. It does. I tell you what. Uh, you know, uh, the, the story is just incredible. But uh, the idea that that first Dimitri, the first false Dimitri, he shows up with the help of Poland, he becomes Tsar, 
He kind of falls out of favor. He falls out of window. He breaks his leg. They shoot him, hang him, burn him into ashes, fire him out of a cannon. A year later, a guy shows up and says, not, doesn't say he's, that that wasn't Dimitri and I'm Dimitri. He said, I am that same guy that was hanged and burned and shot out of a cannon. You hanged, burned, shot the wrong guy out of a cannon. You missed. Yes. Yeah, so, so, uh, that's, so I always, when someone asks me what, what, what I want people to do with my remains, I always say, you know, burn me to ashes and shoot me out of a cannon in the direction of Poland because I'll come <laughs> back in a year. <laughs> I, I love that. Uh, and it's, it's, it really is just such a ridiculous story. Every, every piece of this is, I, well, and I don't think, I mean, you think at the time, you know, nobody, Believed. I don't think anyone was taking it particularly seriously that any of these people were actually Dimitri. And, and, the, and actually, there's a history of that really in Russia. Uh, whenever uh, they're uh, dissatisfied with rulership, uh, then someone's going to come up and they're going to claim that they were this lost noble or something like that to have some claim to the throne. It's actually a long history of that. But during this period, which they called the Time of Troubles, it just makes it that much more serious. And, and of course, then the, the repression becomes that much more serious. And it was yeah. really a difficult time before you get to the Romanov dynasty. Well, and that's what, which is what eventually comes out of this one. But it's it's f full of absolutely crazy characters. I and mean, uh, Ivan the Terrible, who yeah. you know kills his own son, and that yeah, he's that, got he's got a son in there, and he, and he gets in a fight with him and clubs him with the royal scepter. And that so that kills painting, the that painting of him with uh, with with those haunted eyes is is. I, it is honestly, it's 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 a bit horrifying. Uh, but is. he ends up completely, I mean, essentially destroying much of his legacy. Uh, uh, yeah, because of that, and then he, he dies playing chess. He has a stroke right in the middle of a chess game. That's uh, I, his, his youngest son, eight years old, has an epileptic seizure and falls on his own knife. That's hard to believe. Well, and that's um, of course that's what starts this whole thing is that uh, the people in the town didn't believe that either. Yes, they didn't believe <laughs> that either. And then that's the Dimitri. That keeps coming in the Dimitri ads, and we talk about it. What think four of the Dimitris, but I think there were yeah. actually on, on record more than seven or eight of the uh, different Dimitris. They, they we just talk about the most, the most famous of the false Dimitris, and for the most part, they can be kind of described as you know the first one was by far the most successful, and they kind of get less and less successful less, as, yeah, as they get, as you to get the, more false Dimitris. They become even falser. Yeah, because false the the third one like manages to kind of rule over some. Some uh, he makes it across Cossacks the river or something and, like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's, there's, and I think they end up, they end up killing him. And it's, it, you know, it's, it's fair. To, I mean, part of this is unique to Russian culture and Russian history and a period. But I mean, uh, actually, many of the of the medieval European states had periods where there were these secession crises or crises, yeah. and uh, where they would have all sorts of what seems to be crazy stuff going on. Uh, but it's funny how it relates to the other episode that we did today, too. I mean, yeah. how, <laughs> how little Russia changed in between. Yeah, that's the hundreds of years apart, and yet there's there's still some pretty significant sim similarities. So, I, I, I mean, we kind of, we've talked about it, the, the, the core of ridiculousness of this story. And I mean, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of these kind of medieval, uh, as, as we're moving toward the, the early modern period, where it was very important about how rulership would change and who was going to be the heir. and then, But then there were very significant complications about, sometimes it wasn't even clear exactly who would be the heir, or you had someone who didn't have an obvious heir, who didn't name an heir, I mean, stuff like that that would cause all kinds of issues. Kingdoms are, and, uh, you know, I mean, certainly it's no more ridiculous than Henry VIII's children and, and the, you know, the argument over Catherine of Aragon. And is it, I, but it still is just a fascinating, it is really one of those truth is stranger than fiction stories in terms of a of a massive dynasty, and and this is you know there's many more of these in Russian history too oh, yeah. that are interesting. Uh, so you want to you know they want to believe the fine right of kings. So that's that, that's to say you can't you know so the peasants can't come up and just club the king. They want you to believe that the king can be clubbed in the head, but in the end the king can club the king in the head, and everything <laughs> goes crazy. Uh, and so it's 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 a grace, and as you know, it's not a very well known story, especially at all here in the West. And, yeah, well, and he's. I mean, I think there's so much of that. We've talked about a couple of, of things with Russia about how uh, how Russia formed and how that you know because years later how they end up covering you know the whole continent of Asia from mm -hmm. Europe and that's and that's it's really kind of interesting how they how they formed and this was I, I, Ivan was one of the ones who first really kind of started to turn it into a uh, a state in the model of European monarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's I mean that's really interesting. I actually, was just reading too that uh, just just a couple of days ago the uh, a Romanov was married as a kind of in like a royal ceremony there in Russia, and that's first time. It's extraordinary, someone, yeah. Since yeah. A, since that one time they herded all the Romanovs together, yeah, and yeah. Shot them all because yeah. the, this guy is the the great grandson of a cousin of the of uh, Nicholas. That's, that's, I think that's who the, survived. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, they, they were pretty thorough, <laughs> and he grew up in Spain. But I mean, it's kind of interesting how that's. I, I don't know how that's going to work out exactly, or how how much they're going to be a part of. They don't have any 
desire, from what I can tell, to have any actual power controlling the state. But, you know, it's interesting how Europe still embraces the monarchy in various yeah. ways, and, and uh, some of the constitutional monarchy, but a lot of it really just is the symbolism. They don't have any role in government or anything like that, but still, now there's some sort of nostalgia for for the period, and, the, and it's interesting that they're maintaining the bloodlines, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's, you know, it's not just Russia, but I mean, Russia certainly is an interesting story. So. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I also wanted to bring up, this is actually the first episode that I wrote for the channel. This was way back in uh, 2018, and I had read this story and thought, this is too good not to tell, <laughs> basically. And so this was this was the first script I had written. Uh, and then I think I only did like one one or two others in 2018 before I started doing it more regularly. Start writing more regularly. Yeah, yeah, so that that I think that's kind of I mean that's kind of a cool tie-in that this was the first one that I had that I had looked into and written and it was just it was such a fun story. I wanted it, it's now special. I think the title is the title senior writer is executive writer. Executive writer, I think is what is what is yeah, that the title, that's the, what we put on your business card. I think so. I, you know, I tell you, it's a dream to be able to hire your son and work with you. But I mean, this was also the episode that proved that Josh really understood the voice of the channel. And that's cool. The, the number of people that we that we let write for the history guy is pretty small. You don't know. I don't write all the episodes. I write a good number of the episodes, but there's no way we put up the volume we do if I was writing them all. But the number of people that we've allowed to write for the history guy, all people we know and all closely held, uh, and that you know it says something. Josh really understands the channel and really understands the voice of the channel. And yet you also do if you you know look at the ones that Josh wrote versus the ones that I wrote. You're also getting different perspectives too. And this, this Jewish is just a great story. It was fun to tell and and it's it's fun to think about and it's it's an it's a really interesting odd part of history. But I mean it had a huge impact because you know millions yeah. of people were under the rule of this monarch and they you know as they chose you know where it was going to go turned into the Roman of dynasty which would eventually you know roll into the modern era. Yeah, and I mean, when you think about the, the huge differences that could have happened if, or for instance, Dimitri the first, uh, false Dimitri the first, there had had managed to maintain power, maintain power. and it's you know with a, essentially a Polish, uh, if not a puppet, then a very Polish influenced uh, king on the Russian throne. I mean, yeah, that's a and that that's might an interesting. Have been, might ended up being very different in the long run. Yeah, yeah. so it's. I, I, I think of this, you know, I, there are some people who will ask, I mean, ask on the videos, kind of comment, they, or, do you know how lucky you are to work with your, to work with your father and for my father to be, you know, who he is? And I do. I, I think I'm very, <laughs> I, I feel extraordinarily lucky to be able to be doing what I'm doing, which is something that I absolutely love to do. And to be able to do it with my dad and was something that we both, I think we both bond over and we both very much enjoy. It is, I mean, it's an absolute dream. And so, I don't know if you all know, I live in Illinois. Josh lives in Wyoming. We actually don't get to see each other very much. Usually what we're doing here is done uh, with, with him five states away from me. And so we get to come here, go to the Motor Speedway Museum, uh, other museums. We're doing a lot here when we're in Indianapolis and do that together. It's a lot of fun and it is truly a blessing. Uh, and to me, the dream is not just that I've been able to make some sort of living out of telling stories of history, which is what I love to do, but then I've been able to involve my family in that uh, in that business, and uh, it's just, it's wonderful, it's a dream. And if you wonder why we sound a lot alike, eh, people who see us think we look a lot alike too, we are, <laughs> we are definitely related. Yeah, that's, I, I, I hear that a lot. I, my wife actually was just looking at a photo of, of my dad and, and saying, oh, you really do just look just like him. And the, uh, my and my, my grandma, his mom will say, uh, She'll she'll call me Lance sometimes. Uh, she she says that that it's sometimes just like looking back in time. And I'll admit I don't always hear and see it. I think the way that other people do. But uh, I, I mean I I'm proud to be like my dad. So. But we did have we saw a guy today who thought we were brothers. Yeah. What? But to be fair, uh, he's eighty. And his eyesight might be failing a bit. <laughs> that is that is a fair point. So that's uh, and I wasn't sure if because he's he said that that. Uh, you looked young, and so I was like, mm, does, that mean, does that mean I look old? I... <laughs> Magellan is sponsoring this episode of the podcast, and we would like to thank them for making this podcast, like all of our podcasts so far, possible. If you've listened to the podcast at all, you know that we like to talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so what have you been watching recently? Yeah, I just launched one. It's called uh, The World's Most Powerful Telescopes. And I have to say, it's a little different than a lot of ones to watch. It was a little bit techy, uh, but it's about uh, this, these telescopes. And I didn't even know this existed, I have to tell you. The European Southern Observatory, which is in a desert in Chile, 
And there's reasons where because of its location and the climate and that it's a particularly great place for ground observation. And these are the most powerful hmm. telescopes. There's now more than two dozen telescopes there. The first one was built in the 1960s. One of them is literally called, I think, the Very Large Telescope. The thing about this uh, this episode, which is really, is it talks about how each of these different telescopes works, but also talks about like the technology that they use to take out, say, atmospheric distortion. To me, I mean, it was very techy. There wasn't a word in there that I was familiar with before I watched this. I didn't know these telescopes existed, more or less. <laughs> all these things that they could do. In a stark contrast, <laughs> I watched one called On the Yeti Trail. I wasn't sure what to expect from it, but what I will what I will say is it's not it's not like finding Bigfoot where you really have like true believers who are uh, just out there doing everything they can to, you know, make any piece of evidence prove that it's Bigfoot. I, it was mostly looking at it looked at a couple of teams of people who of serious scientists. So these are people who have done other stuff. Like one of the groups was uh, this Danish group that like kind of pioneered the technology to uh, they took like one hair and got the genome of a woolly mammoth out of it. The The concept was kind of looking at these scientific folks who were not really like the true believer type, more like these people were like, if there is evidence, I'm open to the concept of this thing existing. And so the, the guy in Denmark essentially was just like, we are open to the idea of Bigfoot. And if you've got something that you think is a Bigfoot hair, <laughs> send a, it to us. It's an interesting way because, you know, you can go, I mean, there's a lot of stuff they call history and it ends up there yeah. for Bigfoot. And yeah. I have to say, and we don't, you know, it's our channel's on the sort of channel that talks about Bigfoots, but in the same way that I, I wish that Washington eagle was real which we talked about a few episodes ago i mean th there is such a history of people looking for bigfoot that it's such a better story if there is an actual bigfoot and so it's, it's interesting to see as much as you want to say yes or no on, on you know Bigfoot or UFOs or whatever you want to talk about. It's interesting to say, you know, if we actually have science would, which would actually help us try to answer these questions and let's see how that science applies. So yeah. I, I, I'm going to go, I'll go check it out. As always, if you are a listener or watcher of The History Guy, you can go to try.magellantv.com slash The History Guy and we will always have a deal up there. As you can tell, we really enjoy Magellan TV and think that it is worth watching whether you're looking for the kind of stuff that we're making and kind of these hidden history stories or if you're looking for more scientific stuff or if you're on the Yeti trail. Next, the history guy will talk about Svetlana, Stalin's daughter who defected to the United States during the Cold War. On November 22, 2011, an 85-year-old woman named Lana Peters passed away in Wisconsin from complications due to colon cancer. Eventually, her death made it into some newspapers, but it seemed to go largely unnoticed by an American public that seemed to have largely forgotten who she was and all the attention that she had gained during one of the seminal events of the Cold War that happened 53 years ago today, on March 9, 1967. Lana Peters, otherwise known as Svetlana Alueva, represented the contradictions of the era of the Cold War and was witness to some of the greatest crimes of that era. She's most known because of her famous father, but is perhaps most notable because of how very different she was from him. The defection of the woman whose birth name was Svetlana Stalina, the youngest child and only daughter of Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin, deserves to be remembered. Born Yosef Yukashvili in the imperial state of Georgia, then part of the Russian Empire, in 1878, Joseph Stalin already had a reputation for brutality when he was arrested and exiled by the Tsarist government in 1908. He had purportedly been responsible for a bank robbery in 1907 that had killed some 40 people and had, as one historian put it, established himself as Georgia's leading Bolshevik. It was sometime during this period that he started using the name Stalin, meaning roughly, Man of Steel. He spent various periods in exile and on the run, first from the Tsarist government and then the so-called provisional government that existed after Tsar Nicholas abdicated in 1917. During the period when Stalin was in exile, he received aid from Bolshevik supporters Sergei and Olga Alueva, occasionally staying at their home, in 1917. After the October Revolution, Stalin became a trusted supporter of Vladimir Lenin and a vocal supporter of the brutal period of political repression and mass execution called the Red Terror. Appointed People's Commissar for Nationalities in 1919, he took Sergei and Olga's daughter, Nadezhda, who had worked as a clerk in Lenin's office, as his secretary. The two married later the same year. At the time, Nadezhda was 18 and Stalin was a 40-year-old widower, his first wife having died of typhus in 1907. Stalin and Alueva had two children, Vasily, born in 1921, and Svetlana, born in 1926. 
At the time of her birth, Stalin was general secretary of the Soviet Union and had largely gained the upper hand in the struggle to replace Lenin following his death in 1924. As intrigues continued in the Soviet Union, Stalin's daughter was feted by both the Soviet people and her father, who showered her with gifts and called her Little Sparrow. According to her obituary in the New York Times, she became a celebrity in her country compared to Shirley Temple in the United States. Thousands of babies were named Svetlana, so was a perfume. But being the daughter of the Man of Steel did not lead to an easy destiny. While she was being treated like Shirley Temple, Soviet collectivization of the agricultural sector, essentially forcing peasants onto collective farms, was resulting in various periods of famine. Over the period of collectivization, an estimated 14 million people died due to starvation. On November 9, 1932, Yosef and Nadezhda had a public argument about collectivization policy at a dinner party. When they got home that evening, she went into a separate room and shot herself. To prevent scandal, her death was reported as because of an appendicitis. Her children, Vasily was 11 and Svetlana just 6, were told the same lie for fear if they knew the truth that they might accidentally reveal it. Svetlana did not know the truth of how her mother died until she read it in an American newspaper in 1942. Nearly six decades later, she was quoted saying, I do regret that my mother didn't marry a carpenter. While she still enjoyed her father's favor, with a notoriously unsentimental Stalin even playing little games with her, she and her siblings were also under great pressure to be examples to the Soviet people. And even Svetlana was not free from the brutality of her father's regime. In December 1934, when Sergei Kirov, a fellow revolutionary and close friend of Stalin's, was assassinated, Stalin used the event as a provocation for the Great Purge. In fact, some historians argue that it was Stalin who was behind Kirov's murder as a pretext for the repressive effort to purge what Stalin called enemies of the people, including counter-revolutionaries and, essentially, anyone who was a threat to Stalin's power. Among the as many as one and a quarter million victims of the purge was Alexander Zvanich, the brother of Stalin's first wife, whom Svetlana knew as a favorite uncle. More relatives were removed, as well as some of Svetlana's school friends, whose once privileged lives were shattered when their parents were deemed untrustworthy. When she protested to her father on behalf of one of her friends, her father replied to his 14-year-old daughter, Sometimes you are forced to go against even those you love. She later said that it took her years to grasp the extent of her father's crimes. When Germany invaded in 1941, Stalin sent his sons to war. When his oldest son, Svetlana's half-brother Yakov, whom Svetlana affectionately called Yasha, was captured after his unit was overrun, Stalin was furious that Yakov had allowed himself to be taken rather than commit suicide. Far from showing sympathy for his only surviving child from his first marriage, Stalin even had Yakov's wife arrested as untrustworthy. Later, when the Germans offered to trade Yakov for a captured German general, Stalin refused, and Yakov died in a German POW camp, reportedly by suicide. In 1943, Svetlana met and fell in love with filmmaker Alexei Kapler, who was married and 23 years her senior. Kapler later said that he was drawn to Svetlana by the freedom within her. Stalin disapproved for numerous reasons, but Svetlana suspected he was most insulted by the fact that Kapler was Jewish. Kapler was arrested and charged with being a British spy, although it was assumed the actual crime was the indiscreet affair with Stalin's daughter. Stalin destroyed the letters the two had written each other. He banished Svetlana from his house because of moral depravity and even punished her brother, at whose home she had met Kapler and her grandparents for failing to intervene. Kapler was eventually imprisoned for ten years. When Stalin's purges continued after the war, they ensnared more of Svetlana's family, including her mother's sister. When she tried to intervene with her father on her aunt's behalf, Stalin made it clear to her that she also could be accused. On March 2, 1953, she was called from class. Her father had suffered a cerebral hemorrhage and was dying. She later wrote in a memoir, He was dying and I hadn't talked to the doctors, but I did not doubt it for a second. Stalin lingered for four days as she believed God grants an easy death only to the just. As the news of Stalin's death was announced, Svetlana was sitting in a room with his servants. Their complex relationship was clear when she wrote of the memory of that moment. They knew that I had been a bad daughter, and my father had been a bad father, but that he had loved me all the same, as I had loved him. The family had difficulty blaming the man who had been both patriarch and villain. Even as family members returned from the gulag, they became convinced that it wasn't Stalin's fault, that someone else was responsible for making them a political target, that Stalin 
had been poisoned against them. But the prisoners returning from the gulags were compelling evidence of the crimes of Stalin. The new leader who was consolidating power, Nikita Khrushchev, saw bringing down the cult of Stalin as critical to retaining the support of the people. In February 1956, he gave a speech to the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union entitled, On the Cult of Personality and Its Consequences. The speech, popularly called the Secret Speech, began a period of de-Stalinization. While careful to preserve Stalin's views on the party, the speech decried the purges. The speech greatly affected Soviet policy, although it was carefully presented publicly to prevent Western powers from exploiting or criticizing the situation. The speech began a period when repression and censorship were relaxed, known as the Khrushchev Thaw. By then, Svetlana had had two failed marriages and had two children. In 1957, to escape the stigma of her father's name, she went to her mother's maiden name and became Svetlana Alueva. She wandered through love affairs, flirted with different religions, spent another year on a, another failed marriage. A friend later said of her she was a very kind and warm-hearted person, but it was impossible to escape her terrible heritage. She couldn't trust anyone. How could you, if you were Stalin's daughter? She alternatively had to deal with people who sought to associate with her in hope of getting some favor, and others who loathed her for her father's crimes. In 1963, while in the hospital for a tonsillectomy, Svetlana met an Indian national named Brajesh Singh. The Indian government enjoyed a cordial relationship with the Soviet Union, and Singh had become a communist in the 1930s. Singh is the best way to fight for Indian independence. Singh was 53 and suffering from chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Svetlana was 37 and fell in love with a man 16 years her senior. She sought to marry him, but that required state permission. And once again, she suffered from the curse of being Stalin's daughter. In October 1964, Khrushchev was pushed out of power by Leonid Brezhnev. Soviet leadership moved back towards Soviet orthodoxy and Stalin's image was rehabilitated. Purges of intellectuals began again in the Soviet Union. Suddenly, Stalin's daughter was important to the party again and they would not give her permission to marry a foreigner. Even from the grave, her father interfered in her personal life. Singh died from emphysema in October 1966. Singh had asked for his ashes to be scattered over the sacred water of the Ganges River, and Svetlana wanted to fulfill his wishes. She had not expected to be granted permission to travel to India, but Singh's nephew was a minister in the Indian cabinet, and had intervened with Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. Svetlana was allowed to travel to give Singh his traditional funeral, as long as she did not talk to any foreign reporters. She managed to, through stubbornness, get the Soviets to allow her to extend her trip, staying in the village where Singh had lived. She later described the village as a small paradise on earth. But Svetlana was finally compelled to return. She was staying at the guest house of the Soviet embassy in Delhi, and on March 9, 1967, no one apparently suspected her motives when she went outside, hailed a cab, entered the U.S. embassy in India, presented her Soviet passport, and asked for asylum. The request took the Americans completely off guard. Chester Bowles, the U.S. ambassador to India, didn't even know Stalin had a daughter, more or less that she was visiting India. While the defection of Stalin's daughter would be a Cold War coup, the U.S. and the Soviet Union were actually in a delicate phase of negotiating a consular agreement, and Bowles knew that her defection would endanger relations. If he granted her asylum at the U.S. Embassy, it would be surrounded and challenge relations with both India and the Soviet Union. Finally, he decided to get her quickly out of Delhi without making any official promises from the United States to some place where she could more fully consider her decision. Bowles put Svetlana on the next plane to anywhere but Moscow and sent her with a diplomat, actually a CIA agent, as escort to Rome. The assessment by the CIA at the time was, our own preconceived notions of what Stalin's daughter must be like just didn't let us believe that this nice, pleasant, attractive, middle-aged Hofstrau could possibly be who she claimed to be. Svetlana Alieva's defection required a lot of political maneuvering. She had to spend time both in Italy and then in Switzerland before she could finally go to the United States. The Soviets tried to portray her as crazy, calling her Kukshuka or Cuckoo Bird. Later it was revealed that the KGB had made plans to either kidnap her or assassinate her, but they decided not to because it would be too easy to trace back to them. Finally, in the United States, she supported herself by selling a manuscript of a memoir that she had written while in the Soviet Union. The book, Twenty Letters to a Friend, is a deeply personal, if romanticized, memoir of her family that was described in the Los Angeles Times as fascinating, revealing, profoundly human, and significant. 
It receives some criticism for pushing off many of her father's crimes to his rival, Lavrenti Beria, but finishes with a notable conclusion about the time of her father's purges, a period where estimates of the death toll of her father's leadership range between 9 and 20 million. We are all responsible for everything that happened. The sales from the book allowed her to, among other things, build a hospital in Braja Singh's village in India. In the United States, she married one last time, between 1970 and 1973, to an architect named William Peters. They had a daughter named Olga. She went by the name Lana Peters for the rest of her life. In 1978, she became a U.S. citizen, but in 1984, she and her daughter Olga returned to the Soviet Union. She was convinced that was the only way to reconnect with the children that she had left there. The move required that she repudiate much of the criticisms of the Soviet Union that she made while she was in the West but she found she was shunned there, and she and Olga returned to the United States in 1986. She had spent much of the earnings she had earned from her books on charity, and lived in near poverty towards the end of her life, and the woman who in her youth had been compared to Shirley Temple, who had raised such a furor when she defected in 1967, faded into obscurity. When author Nicholas Thompson decided he wanted to interview her for a book he was doing on U.S.-Soviet relations during the Cold War in 2006, he had to do a public record search to find her. She was living in Wisconsin. When she passed away in November 2011, the New York Times found it difficult to even confirm her death, which wasn't even reported in the local newspaper. It's not clear if in that obscurity she found the little paradise on earth that she was looking for, but it does seem that the woman who was so unlike her father had finally escaped her father's shadow. So this story, uh, so much different than the Dimitri story, but similar in its own ways, and pretty much in the same place, despite hundreds of years of difference, is incredible. And I, I think one of the one of the things that's really incredible about it is that you start talking about her death, mm -hmm. and despite the the uproar that it made when when it all happened, and just she she was unknown. She achieved anonymity, yeah. And that's, so, it's, it's, it's really quite yeah, incredible. At the time that she died in Wisconsin, I don't think most Americans remember that she was in the United States. Certainly didn't realize that she was still alive and that she, you know, she died, you know, very, very much as, you know, as she wanted to in anonymity. But who, who would have guessed that Stalin's own surviving child or daughter died in Wisconsin, uh, you know, virtually unknown. Why do you think, what, what do you think some, some of the reasons for that? Were. Well, I mean, part of that is that the Soviet Union essentially shifted so significantly after Stalin that I think, you know, at first there was a huge fascination, uh, but also, I mean, it had to do with the taunt and, and uh, you know, the rivalry with the Soviet Union had calmed down. And so, I mean, it just wasn't, uh, you know, at the time that she, uh, that she first affected, I mean, that was, that was a much more salient idea. But also, I mean, you know, the, you know, the interest just does die down over time. She's married a couple of times. She's not seeking fame. Uh, you know, so, you know, she sort of faded from the public consciousness. Well, that, I mean, that makes sense to me that, you know, we kind of have uh, less going on with the Soviet Union. And it was, it was more, more than anything, I mean, a symbolic uh, victory, yeah, having her yeah. come over. It wasn't, because she, she didn't really, um, I, she was probably questioned by uh, people and stuff like that. But I, it's not like the, you know, she didn't really come over with some huge collection yeah, of vital intelligence. intelligence it was entirely uh, propaganda. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it meant something that Stalin's daughter was leaving because she thought that, that Russia had been repressive. It was really interesting that, you know, Stalin, Joseph Stalin's daughter would rather live in the West. I mean, that was, you know, that all had meaning. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, she was in her way, I mean, they said at the time that she was like their, uh, 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 Oh, Shirley Temple. Shirley Temple. I mean, she was very well known, and, and so I mean, it, it was also she was a star, and that's you know the star. And then there was you know some cold, more dramatics to getting her out of the country, and some fear the Soviets would kill her rather than get her into the country and stuff like that. And, Which they do seem to have considered doing, uh, but I, you have to think that honestly, it wouldn't. I mean, first of all, everyone would have known what would have hap what happens, and no one would have been like, oh, who who could have done that? Uh, but I I don't I don't know that that would have reflected well on them to to. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because she wasn't totally disillusioned with the Soviet Union. She really, she she had fallen in love another time with another man, and the Soviet Union was not going to let her be with this this man from India. Uh, and that's really what caused her disillusion. Something very personal. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the you know the intrigue of her you know hiding her whereabouts and, and and sneaking out into a cab and getting into the the American embassy and then they didn't know what to do with her. And uh, I mean, that was all. Just that they, you know, that's as exciting as any. I mean, there should be a movie about that. I mean, that's yeah. as exciting as any other Cold War story you've ever shown come up on a movie. Well, and she really is an interesting. Uh, she's an interesting person. Who I, I mean, Joseph Stalin was her father, and I, 
I try to think of that. And it's it's hard to think of Stalin as anything but, you know, this like historical figure that he is. And I try to understand how on earth it must have felt to grow up as his child. And he you know, he was he did not play favorites with his family. So she had aunts and uncles that were caught in the purges. Uh, and uh, her best friend's parents were caught in the purges. Yeah. Uh, and he always made it clear that he wasn't going to protect his daughter over the state and you know, over the way he treated his oldest son. And she said she told him when the Nazis captured him, they said, well, he should have been captured alive anyway. And they, you know, he committed suicide uh, because uh, his dad didn't want him to come home after what happened. So yeah, uh, it really, I mean, it, it, it does not present the story as Fetlana does not present her father in a positive light in any way. But it's, it does present, I mean, she as she says, I mean, she realizes that he had his faults. But there's still something in there of this familial, I mean, she she mm-hmm. says that she loved him. Mm-hmm. And it's it's hard to imagine, it's it's a step difficult sometimes to imagine someone who we really know is a monster of history as being capable of having his child's yeah, love. Yeah, also, yeah, she called him dad. Yeah, it's yeah a, that's it. But a, I mean, clearly even she recognized, you know, there was a danger to him. And so, I mean, that part of the story, uh, I mean, it just tells you a lot about Stalin. Whole, whole yeah. part of it, but it also tells you about what happened after Stalin, and you know they kind of had they didn't know what to do because they were de-Stalinizing, uh, and and uh, but you know they weren't going to get rid of Svetlana, and they kind of didn't know what to do with her. And then when she wanted to leave, you know they didn't know if they wanted to keep her, but they certainly didn't want her to leave. And I mean it's it, it, she's stuck in an amazingly odd position, yeah, and and then you know ends up being able to you know just live out a quiet life. That's that's just extraordinary. Which is, I mean, honestly, I, th- I think she would have considered it definitely. I mean, a happy ending. Well, except that a, she was separated from her children, and yeah. because of that, oh, that's, and she did. That's right, and she went about. back and tried to. Yeah, it's. I mean, there's a lot of tragedy in in this story from all from her friends and the. I mean, honestly, even the idea of her realizing that then when she gets old enough to start trying to intercede. Mm-hmm. On behalf of some of her, you know, like her friends' parents and stuff like that, I, th- that realization that. Uh, he, you know, you might be his daughter, but yeah, that doesn't protect the people. He doesn't protect you or the people yeah. around you. Yeah. yeah, you, you coming to try to intercede is is absolutely meaningless to him. That's not. That's he's not yeah. going to stop because of that. So part of the story truly does seem tragic, and yeah. part of it seems, uh, you know, I mean, very much Cold War drama, exciting stuff, uh, and you know, part of it is almost farcical when you when you understand what life was like and, and how they treated her when you know after his death and the tragedy side, you know, uh, what's going to happen. Uh, and I mean, and part of it's a love story, and it really is just a life story of someone that was caught up in events that she, you know, she was just born into. She didn't, you know, she didn't want to be part of those events, yeah. uh, and how she took control of her life, you know, despite all odds, how she took control of her life. And you know, she this is a woman who took money that she got from her book and used to build hospitals in India. So it's it's hard not to like Svetlana. I mean, she yeah. she she comes out of it a true heroine. Yeah, I, I, and it's. It just must have been so difficult to live some... I mean, she lived almost as a virtual prisoner, mm-hmm. uh, where she's she's trapped and unable to do, you know, what she wants to do, but also unable to do anything else. And I, it's it's hard to... It's really hard to imagine what it was like to be her when, I mean, after Stalin's death, they're essentially just thinking of her as a, you know, as a tool or a pawn or a, a symbol. And, and you never know when they might decide that that's a liability. And, which they did know, all the time. Yeah. yeah, that's the... she And she had to be, I mean, daughter of Stalin, she had to be yeah, aware so she, of that. She, she, she didn't get to choose her own life. She knew that she was always under some sort of risk. Her family was always... Even when she... Even when her dad was in charge, her family's at some sort of risk. And, and I mean, the, any of the power of the Soviet state was was as dangerous to her, maybe more dangerous because she, because uh, she was such a high profile uh, as anybody else living in the Soviet state at the time. So it doesn't. I mean, I have to say we don't try to do politics here, but this, the story of Svetlana at the time does not portray the Soviet Union in a particularly positive light. But I mean, that's that's history. That's that's I, I, that's really what was going on. It is it is an interesting way to view what was going on in the Soviet Union at the time because it was I, I, it's. We have this historical vision of you know the Cold War, but this was in in many ways a more personal vision yeah. of it. And and that's and, and that's a great. Uh, I mean, like any other war, I mean, you talk about the generals and the strategies, and you know, it affects real people. And yeah. this is a real story of a real person, uh, really caught up in the Cold War, and that's that's a compelling and interesting story. She never, I mean, she never seemed interested in. Uh, trying to seize that part of it oh, she no, she no, wanted she to any interest in power yeah no. she she wanted to to live her life but she was, it was never like you know she tried to but yeah. i also think that you know like many living in the behind the iron curtain she wanted to live a life without fear yeah. and a life where she could make choices for herself but i mean her choices are probably even more limited than the average the yeah. average soviet 
because because of her position. Even with you know the the benefits of of wealth and things like that, you're right. I mean, she she no matter where she went, she was going to be watched. Mm -hmm. There was no way for her to you know travel someplace. Although then she goes to India and apparently finds that uh, mm -hmm. you can't slip away with the whole oh, method that she slipped away. And you know we, that's abbreviated because we tell 15 minute stories. Yeah, it's really worth it to get her autobiography. That whole story of how she planned it. Uh, and how she managed to slip away under these watchful eyes, you know, at a point when they kind of had become convinced that she wasn't a risk. But I mean, that was—I mean, she was she was brilliant in doing that, yeah. and it, it truly, truly a heroine in in a harrowing story of Cold War espionage uh, for someone who had no interest in being part of the Cold War. Just the, really, what she was trying to do was escape that war. And so, I mean, I think kind of closing this, you know, that this is an interesting pair of episodes to put together mm -hmm. because they're so far apart. And yet, and both essentially children of uh, Russian mm -hmm. leaders or Soviet, uh, but from people who were both ruling from, say, you know, Moscow or St. Petersburg, those, the, I mean, in mm -hmm. Russia. And despite them both having lived very different lives and the stories being very different, it's, it's interesting, I think, to consider in what ways they're similar. And, and, and like you said, I mean, these were, these were the children of leaders, uh, leaders that had virtually dictatorial power. Uh, it has a lot to do with Russian culture and Russian thinking, and uh, as so, I mean, to that extent, it's really kind of funny, or not funny, but it's it's ironic that you see these stories that have this similarity over such a distance. Uh, though she's not seeking power, it wasn't a false Svetlana. Yeah. But I mean, it's you know the idea that the the child becomes the pawn, and the decision over who's going to have power uh, is really is really a, a compelling story. And so I, I mean that that similarity, you have to think that uh, you know she she felt very much like the the, the children of of uh, uh, Ivan did the the weight of the crown upon you. Yeah. And, and but it was never you know just like the first Dimitri was never more than a pawn in the game. That kid was never more than a pawn, and oh, I don't yeah. think anybody really believes that he fell on his knife. No, right? So I mean, he was he was a threat. He was a threat to the throne, and and so he was killed. And 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 you have to think that she felt that same kind of sort of weight upon yeah. her, you know, that she would be used to try to you know to take power, which is what was going on with the false Dimitris and stuff like that. Yeah, because I I have to think the false Dimitris were pawns and they're, too. They're both stories that are just very Russian. It shows how oh, yeah. different the Russian culture is from a really kind of in some ways anywhere at the time, but also different than you know how things would have played out in the West. And not trying to say one is better than the other, whatever. This, these are both really stories. And tell especially people from the West a lot about you know how Russian culture is a little bit different than the way we you know, we would have seen this in the in the West. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.